Good morning, everyone. Gosh, Palm Sunday. What a great day. What a great day for Palm Sunday, too. Can you imagine a day like today, having a triumphal entry? As an altar boy growing up in Orlando, Florida, I can honestly say that Palm Sunday was my favorite Sunday of all the holy days, and there were a lot of holy days in the Catholic Church. And here's why. The celebration. I'm a seven on the Enneagram, right? I must have even been as a kid. Love the celebration of Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, the plants, the palms, the singing, the donkey. <laughs> At the big church downtown, they'd have an actual donkey come in down the down aisle. Us uh, altar boys, they'd have all the altar boys with palms, and we'd wave them as we walked down the aisle to open mass. It was awesome. And then afterward, on our way out, we'd get palms. You know, they'd hand everybody the fronds. As soon as we got to the car, we'd start weaving them into our... Um, into uh, crosses and braids and things like that. And uh, when my mom got home, she would put hers over the picture of Jesus and it would stay there for about a year. We weren't allowed to throw them away because they were blessed. You couldn't throw them away as trash. You had to bring them back to the church where they would be incinerated and, and smudged on your forehead the next year. So this very palm I am weaving into a cross today, maybe smudged on my forehead 325 days later. What could be cooler than that, right, as a kid? I also celebrated the fact that it's the last Sunday in Lent. I could go back to doing that thing. I gave up, whatever that was. So in catechism, we were taught that, the, uh, that Jesus entered the city on a young donkey to declare himself the Messiah and King of the Jews, and these were his followers. And knowing that he would be tried and crucified, he welcomed his fate to rise from the grave and save us from sin. Now, as a 12-year-old, I had no idea what that meant at all, and I wasn't about to ask the notoriously punitive nuns, or I would get my, I would get my knuckles <laughs> whacked with a, they did that back then, this is the 60s. To me at that time, though, Jesus was a superhero, to a 12 or 14 year old boy, you know, he had all these cool superpowers, he could walk on water and read minds, he predicted the future, heal people with a touch, calm the, oh, I mean, calm the seas. He seemed just like a, a regular superhero to me. And then he would swoop in and save the damsels from distress, from being stoned. And superheroes to me don't stand up and say, I am your leader, kneel down and worship me. Superheroes are usually there to serve the world and not to rule it. So the real heroes, uh, you know, today, Palm Sunday, uh, begins the Christian Holy Week, the most sacred week in our calendar as Christians. It uh, marks the last days before Jesus' death. But the first Palm Sunday uh, was part of the Jewish Passover and spanned nine days. And today we know from historians and Bible scholars that on that first day of Passover, which by the way was yesterday, uh, you maybe you heard the Roman Imperial Army led by Pontius Pilate entering the city through the west gate with their gold armor and helmets glittering the cavalry on steeds brandishing their weapons they were waving their banners and beating their drums all as a show of Roman force and Roman dominance meant to intimidate the Jews and to behaving themselves and as you can imagine many of the Jews resented that here, the, here were their Roman oppressors giving the Jews this finger wag on the celebration of their freedom from Egypt it was very likely that some rebellious outbreaks could occur during the Passover, and in fact, one did. <laughs> a lot of Bible scholars uh, like Marcus Bork, for instance, in his book The Last Week, theorized that Jesus' procession was a planned political protest against Roman occupation. But the triumphal entry is depicted in all four Gospels, and in the Gospels, there's no indication that it was nothing more than a near spontaneous eruption of joy from one, for one of their own, for one of their own people. And only from the Gospel of John and the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, which is thought to have be, been by, from the same source, possibly even the same author, do we learn that it may have even been planned the very night before at a banquet that was held, uh, given by Mary and Martha, for their brother Lazarus, who was just raised from the dead, and for Jesus and his disciples. So this is from the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, chapter 32. Then six days before the Pesach, that's the Passover, Yeshua came to Bethany where Eleazar was, where Eleazar was, whom he had raised. 
There they had prepared a supper for him and for the other disciples. Martha and the sister of the companion served them, and Eleazar was one of the reclining at the table with them. Then Miriam, the beloved companion, took a jar of oil, pure and expensive spikenard, and poured it upon the head of Yeshua and anointed him. And the house was full of the sweet fragrance of the ointment. And seeing what she had done, the disciples therefore grumbled against her amongst themselves. But hearing this, Yeshua said to them, Leave her be. She has anointed me for what I am come to do and done what she is appointed to do. Only from the truth I tell you, whenever they speak of me, what she has done this day will also be told in memory of her. And we can see that it still is. You do not know or understand what she has done, but I tell you this. When all have abandoned me, only she will stand beside me like a tower. A tower built on a high hill and fortified cannot fall, nor can it be hidden. From this day forth, she shall be known as Migdala, for she shall be as a tower to my flock, and the time will soon come when her tower shall stand alone by mine. A beautiful declaration of Mary's um, prominence that day. It goes on to say then, on the next day, the great multitude that had gathered for the Pesach heard that Yeshua was coming to Jerusalem. They collected branches of palm and went out to meet him. They cast their branches on the path before him as he rode on a donkey into the city, crying, Hosanna, blessing on him who comes in the name of the Spirit, King of Israel. The people who were with him when he restored life to Eleazar bore witness to it all. That is where the multitude came out to welcome, that is why the multitude came out to welcome him, for they had heard that he had performed this wonder. The Pharisees therefore said amongst themselves, see, we can do nothing. The whole of the city now follows him. So it's possible that uh, Jesus didn't even know this was happening before he headed down to Jerusalem. But the point is, this is the point. All of these events are shrouded in mystery. And many may be not known for certain, but planned or not, here's the thing. Jesus knew that Caiaphas had a hit out on him, yet here he came, a one-man processional. No army on steeds, just a single Jew on a donkey. No swords, no swords, but palm branches. No show of dominance, but a show of humbleness and meekness. The Roman procession raised their emperor as the son of God. Jesus' procession said, all men are sons of God. The Romans waved their banners of gold and marched to the sound of drums. But Jesus' procession waved palm branches of peace and chanted, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Spirit. Pilate's procession proclaimed the power of empire. Jesus' procession proclaimed the kingdom of God. So here we have two very contrasting processions. Metaphysically, Pilate's procession represents the ego, the physical body subject to the whim of the senses, the desire for power and dominance. Jesus' procession represents our higher spiritual nature, which serves to work for the greater good of all. Now, Jesus didn't sneak into town unnoticed. He rode into the city with a flourish and a fanfare, mocking the Romans and the high priests in one fell swoop. And he didn't stop there. During the next five days, he made his famous appearance in the temple, which got the attention of a lot of people. He confounded the priests and the, and the, uh, the, the chief priests in, the, in public twice. He called his killers to be hypocrites and sinners. He even healed on the Sabbath. Sabbath, right out in public, where everyone could see. This was not Jesus saying, kneel and serve me. This was Jesus saying, I'm willing to die to make my point. It was Jesus at a Texas Hold'em game saying, I'm all in. I was trying to fathom what could possibly be going through Jesus' head at that time. And in order to really understand the courage and the confidence and the commitment of Jesus, I put myself in Jesus' place. I decided to ask myself, what would I have done in that situation? I, a little game that I call, what would Richard do? So here it is. 
It's the Holy Week. It's the Passover. It's the pilgrimage. It's part of my spiritual custom to go to Jerusalem, gather at the temple for prayer and worship. But the religious leaders have openly called me blasphemous, made it clear they want me dead. I have this message of peace and empowerment to deliver, but is this the best time? Perhaps I can just sneak into the city, teach in the dark corners to small groups. But enter into the city with a flourish and a fanfare, letting my would-be assassins know exactly where I am, and then continue to tick them off all week long? What would Richard do? Good question. That would take a lot of cojones, which I'm not sure I would have had. What would you have done? The answer to that question, to me, is what Palm Sunday is really about. We can see from reading the Gospels that Jesus never taught anything he himself didn't demonstrate. So what was he demonstrating to his followers this day? He was demonstrating the courage of the Christ. Now we have a lot of modern examples of this. We still have one week left in our season for nonviolence, uh, honoring Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi, both known for their courage and commitment to a message. Martin Luther King was all in for an idea. They say that Martin knew of his assassination threat before he stepped out on that balcony in Memphis on April 4th, one week from today, 53 years ago. He clearly acted from a sense of greater good over self-preservation. He was also demonstrating the courage of the Christ. Unity's co-founder Charles Fillmore said that Palm Sunday symbolizes the physical nature coming under control of the spiritual nature, and it's symbolized by Jesus on the beast. So this was King's, Dr. King's physical nature coming under the control of his spiritual nature, which always does what's best for the greater good. That's what allowed him to step out on that balcony, knowing that it could be, the, be his death. Of course, Mahatma Gandhi was continually getting death threats from Indian citizens who didn't agree with his philosophy of nonviolent resistance. Much like Jesus' followers, Gandhi's followers wanted him to lead an army against, Brit Brit against the British. But Gandhi knew that violence wasn't the solution, and he continued to teach and demonstrate the courage of the Christ openly until his death on January 30th, 73 years ago, and some change. So if we look at Jesus, we see this wasn't the magical Jesus that walked on water or rose from the dead or calmed the storms or healed the blind with a touch. This was Jesus the man, the man demonstrating extraordinary courage and confidence through nonviolent resistance. Now what did all three of these guys have in common? For one thing, they all had deep roots in their faith. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi, Dr. King, a Christian minister, and Gandhi was a devout Hindu. But Jesus did not pray for God to free the Jews. King did not pray for God to rewrite the civil rights laws, and Gandhi didn't pray that the British would just release India from its rule, no. Yes, they prayed, but then they took on the role of that to which they would pray. They became God in the world. Their prayers were for the sole purpose of aligning themselves with the God of their being. So it would be revealed to them what must be done, and then they would have the courage and the conviction to do it. Pope Francis recently said, pray for the poor and feed them. Pray for the poor and feed them. Take action. So here's the Palm Sunday lesson for this year, and it's a pretty hopeful year so far. Yes, it's about courage, but it's also about a choice, about a choice between two processions. Marcus Borg wrote in that book the last week that I mentioned earlier, Pilate's procession embodied the power, glory, and violence of the empire that ruled the world. Jesus' procession embodied an alternative vision the kingdom of God. Holy Week and the journey of Lent are about an alternative procession, an alternative journey, an anti-imperial and nonviolent procession. Which journey are we on? 
Which procession are we in? So if Easter is about overcoming death, Palm Sunday is about conquering life, our physical human nature coming under control of our spiritual nature. It's about being a witness to a higher purpose for ourselves and for the world. Easter asks us to believe in a miraculous event, a supernatural miracle that was attributed to Jesus in an effort to legitimize a young Christian church. It's an event that's shrouded in mystery, mostly unproven. And Unity churches like us are forced to face some place some metaphysical meaning on the crucifixion and and resurrection to keep it relevant for us. But Jesus' triumphal entry was a real event that almost certainly happened. There's no mystery around it. We're not asked to believe in any miraculous act that Jesus did. We're not asked to grant Jesus deity status because of it. Because this was no miracle. It was Jesus doing what he did best, demonstrating the spiritual power and courage that exists in each of us. This was Jesus at his most human and at his most divine. It was Jesus, the man, demonstrating the courage of the Christ. Each of us has a direct link to that very same courageous spirit. Martin Luther King found and expressed it. Mahatma Gandhi found it within himself and expressed it. And so can you, friends. Now let's prepare ourselves for meditation. Begin breathing slowly in and out, letting your exhales be just a little longer than your inhales and slowing slowing that breath down so that you can bring your consciousness into this now moment where it all happens, where everything exists, where the presence of God is at its most vital, vibrating within us, in us, as us, and through us. With each inhale, as we let that, feel that air go through our nostrils and down into our abdomen and fill our heart center, think of that inhale as an invitation to spirit to speak to you now. With every exhale, we surrender. We surrender our will to the one will. We allow our hearts to open and to find that courage, that higher purpose. We ask for it to be revealed to us. The very same light that is in Jesus Christ is in you. The courage to face any challenge, the confidence to take the next step, the compassion to help those less fortunate, the commitment to a higher purpose for your life. All of these qualities are alive in you just as they were in Jesus. Let's take this great knowing and realization into just a few moments of silent prayer together. breathe in, we give thanks. We give thanks for this time together, for this beautiful spiritual center that brings us together and nourishes us. We give thanks for the Christ center that allows us to tap in to all that Jesus was, to 
move forward fearlessly and courageously. For this we give thanks and say, and so it is.